and begin. Thank you for joining us for our first ever Iowa Arts Council Art Up. This is Veronica O'Hearn, and I'm Grants and Program Specialist at the Iowa Arts Council. And this is Joseph Pearson. I'm Community Resources Specialist at the Iowa Arts Council. The Iowa Arts Council, a division of the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, is your state arts agency, and we are pleased to present Art Ups, which are free professional development events for Iowa's artists, arts organizations, and communities. And today we are pleased to host Victoria Rogers, local partnership coordinator at Kickstarter, who will present Kickstarter How To. However, before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items. Um, as you have all already heard, all of the lines will be open for the duration of the webinar. However, if you would like to mute your own line to eliminate background noise, please do so by pressing star 6. You can unmute your line at any time by pressing star 7. We will have a Q&A at the end of the webinar. However, if you would like to send burning questions to Victoria during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat feature on the left-hand side of your screen. You may also use the chat feature if you are experiencing any technical difficulties. And finally, please be aware that this webinar is being recorded for future use. Um, thank you all again for joining us today. And now we'll go ahead and turn it over to Victoria. Awesome. Hi. Um, thank you guys all for being a part of this. Um, I'm really excited to get to talk to you all and hear your questions. And so I thought that we'd start maybe first with me just giving a little bit of background on Kickstarter, what we do, our impact on culture, go through some how-tos for people who are interested in starting a campaign and kind of figuring out where do they start because it can be a really overwhelming pr process. And then um, at the end, I think we'll have plenty of time for questions before we wrap up at 3 o'clock. Um, so yeah, feel free to, to send any burning questions your way, but I'll also leave ample time um, at the end to answer them. And obviously let me know if, if I'm not talking loud enough or um, if you're having trouble seeing the slides. I, I've never used this ReadyTalk conference before, so it's the first time. So first, I guess just to get started, I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of Kickstarter and how we came to be. Uh, we believe that we're all capable of creating incredible things, and we're actually started by a group of artists themselves. So I think Perry Chen, who um, was a visual artist, and Yancy Strickler, who's a writer, focused on music, also a musician himself, and Charles Adler, a designer. And essentially, they, they came together um, you know, over the course of actually several years of developing the idea for Kickstarter um, to create a platform that would really allow people to make amazing things without needing necessarily the backing of a gallery or a big Hollywood studio um, in order to make it happen. So they thought, you know, we really believe in this idea that if enough people want something to happen, that it should be able to happen. Um, and that if you have an awesome idea and you're able to get people on board in support of it, it shouldn't matter who they are and what their connections are, but instead it should be this real opportunity to create something with people who are supportive of you. Um, so we were founded in 2009. We've been around for, I guess we're going on six years, um, which is pretty exciting. And we've, we've seen just so many projects come to life, and it's, it's been great to see how, how the model has grown over time. And this is me. Um, as was mentioned, I work on our local partnerships, which is, is really digging into some of the markets that we haven't spent a lot of time in, but that we think have a really great potential to use Kickstarter. And I've been um, on the team for just over a year now. So even since I've been there, we've grown quite a bit. We moved from our Lower East Side uh, tenement building to a building out in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. So if you're ever in the neighborhood, uh, definitely get in touch. Um, we love having people over, and we also have been able to use this new space to really welcome the public in and have film screenings and gallery shows and musical performances so we can actually celebrate some of the awesome work that's been created using our platform online, offline. Um, I think that's been probably the most exciting thing about our move. So next, next slide. I just wanted to talk a little bit about our impact, about the awesome projects we've seen, the kind of broad spectrum of things that we've seen on site. Um, 
some of the top line stats. So we've had over 74,000 projects successfully funded, um, which is pretty awesome. And more projects are being funded every day. We've had over 7.4 million backers fund those projects. So for us, our backers are, the, are our supporters, the people who get behind a project, pledge money to it, and become part of the community around the project. Um, we've had over $1.4 billion pledged across projects. So some big numbers, um, but each project is really started by a person with an idea um, who brings a community and develops a community around their project. Um, these are some, some favorite projects I'm going to go through now, and it kind of shows the breadth of Kickstarter. We have 15 different categories on site, so anything from journalism to technology to design to food to art, um, to visual arts specifically, to theater, um, dance, film. It's really a broad, broad spectrum, and I think if, if you have something that you want to make, then there's probably a home for it on Kickstarter, um, regardless of the category that it ends up fitting into. This is a favorite project. It's called the Microphone. It's part of the MoMA's permanent collection now, which is really exciting. We actually just found out some news that the MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art based in New York, um, is going to be taking on a few more objects that were funded through Kickstarter campaigns um, into their collection. And we've had a couple of collaborations with them where they've actually sold works in their store. So, oh no. So this, the microphone, as I was mentioning, is now part of the MoMA's collection, but you can see here that over 4,000 people came together um, to make it happen. Yeah, so Joe, it says, she said Joe's much louder. Hmm. I wonder why that is, going in and out. Are other people having that same, that same experience, them going in and out? See, you're coming through pretty clearly for um, me, Victoria. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll I'll try to speak up, um, and then if if there's anything that's particularly unclear and of interest, then definitely ask a question about it at the end, and um, I'll make sure that I'm, I'll make sure that you're able to hear it. We can kind of focus in on it then. Um, but so so anyway, with the microphone, it's this MoMA work. Um, and it's a low-cost mine detonator, so it essentially kind of goes over land and picks up mines and explodes them. So it operates in this place between art um, and social social culture. Um, so the next one is Marina Abramovic Institute. She's an amazingly famous artist in the contemporary art world. I'm sure many of you guys know about Marina's work. Um, and she decided to come to Kickstarter because she wanted to create the first performance art institute, which is essentially a place where people could learn her methodology. Um, she loves quiet time. She loves having moments where people are kind of becoming one with themselves and with the people in the room around them. And she felt like in contemporary society, we don't have too many moments like that. Um, we're more of a digitally connected space. And so she wants to create a performance art institute where people will be able to learn her methodology. And she had over 4,000 people come together to help support her in that endeavor. And this is another favorite. Um, Hans Fex created the mini museum. I actually pledged myself for one of these and just received it last week. And essentially, he just, as a hobby, had been collecting rare specimens from all over the world, anything from pieces of meteor um, to part of Dracula's coffin, to human skull matter, um, to dinosaur bones, I mean, all kinds of kind of crazy objects. And so he realized that there might be an opportunity to share these with the world. And so he created these mini museums. Um, you can see them lined up here, and it might not be immediately clear, but each one of these little rectangular shapes is a museum where he's taken small components of each of these rare specimens and put them together and labeled them. Um, and so over 5,000 people came on to, to Hans's kind of hobby and, and turned it into this real amazing network of people who were, who were interested in, in the work that he was doing. Um, another really great one is two artists came together to paint an entire favela in Rio de Janeiro. Um, you can see here, this is the, the 
part of the favela, actually, not the whole one after it's been painted. And it's this amazing public mural project that really is a community-based effort. Um, it's something that takes place in physical space and actually was up during um, during the World Cup. So people were able to see it, and they had over 1,000 people say, yes, I think this is an incredible idea that I want to support and be a part of. So you've got just a few more to look at, and they're all quite different. Um, this is Plus Pool, which is an idea. This is actually, this image that you're seeing is actually um, a prototype of, or an image of, of what it could potentially look like. But essentially, a group of architects came together and said, hey, what, would, what could we do that would make people really excited to be in the East River? And we're surrounded by this water, but New Yorkers aren't able to use it. And so they're coming up with this like filtering and irrigation system um, that's going to make it possible for this plus-shaped pool um, to operate in the river using the river water and cleaning it um, so that people can swim in it. And so they actually were raising money to, to fund their idea and, and all of the work that they have to do in order to make sure that it's actually a viable, a viable project um, from kind of testing the waters um, to see what different pH levels are, are in the East River and then kind of figuring out, too, what pH level is okay for people to swim in. Um, but I think it's a really excellent example of a project that is really dreaming big um, and using Kickstarter as a means to see, hey, are other people excited about this, too? Um, is it worth kind of investigating this and seeing if it's possible um, just because it's, it's so awesome that um, you know, we spotted this idea, but we don't have necessarily the funds to actually put forth to making sure it happens. And so um, even though this is not yet a reality, I think there are a lot of people who are excited about the potential. And this is a smaller project, um, a student-based project actually called X-Space uh, Project H Designs, um, who are behind this project, have done a couple of projects on Kickstarter. And essentially what it is is bringing people together um, around a student idea. The students realized that they didn't have a library that was satisfactory. They didn't feel like they had a space to kind of relax and read and discover new books. And so they thought, why don't we make one? Um, they came to Kickstarter to do that, and they developed this kind of X-shaped design that you see here of people. Um, they, they both made the X-shaped design for their own library, but then also made extras for people who pledged to the project so that you could kind of create your own mini library um, in conversation with theirs. And then the final project that I want to talk about um, is, again, another smaller one, but I think one that really speaks to the nature of the community on Kickstarter. Um, there's this group of artists who create giant ice sculptures um, and put them up in front of important moments. And so you can see here, um, this is democracy, but actually what they were raising money for were the words the future which they wanted to put in outside of the UN summit. And then the idea is that the ice kind of melts, and it, it tells the story of, of what the importance is of that word um, that ends up melting. And so there's really quite a range, as you can see here, kind of all kinds of projects, whether it's sculpture, whether it's design, um, whether it's visual arts. Kickstarter is really this place for, for people to explore. Um, it's a place to try something new. It's a place to, to gather people around you and support you in that venture. And so I think the next thing is kind of apt is to talk about our community and the, the types of people who are on Kickstarter. So as I mentioned, we're a vibrant community of people that want to help bring new ideas to life. Um, and I think what's so interesting is that it's, uh, Kickstarter is often this medium where people who, who maybe didn't even know that there were others out there who they, who they didn't who they thought would be excited about their project um, are able to find them through the site. So it's a place of discovery um, as much as it is a gathering place of people who might already be in your network. So these are just some top line stats on our backers. Um, I think the most exciting one, for me at least, is that 243,000 people have backed more than 10 projects. Um, so that's kind of crazy. Essentially what it means is that these are people who are real kind of Kickstarter diehards who are coming back over and over again in order to fund the next big idea. Um, and you can see here 62% of money pledged comes from repeat backers, which is, again, huge. That's people um, who enjoyed their experience or are curious about another new idea and come back to the space. 
So to kind of dig in a little bit about how this actually all works, right? we've seen that there's some amazing projects that have happened through Kickstarter campaigns. But um, there might be some questions about how to and what does it mean to actually do this yourself. Um, you know, every project is very different, but I'd like to kind of go through kind of top line, what are the best practices, and then in the question se session, um, I'd love to hear maybe more ideas about what people are specifically working on or curious about pursuing through Kickstarter. So first is, you know, what is a project? Uh, people ask this all the time because they think it's so open-ended that sometimes it can actually be confusing, um, which is just that essentially a project is something that you want to create, something new that you want to make. Um, you know, make doesn't have to be with your hands, but it can be something, you know, could be making um, a theatrical performance, making a music video, um, making a new type of cupcake, really anything that you're creating that's new, that is shareable, um, something that's going to be a part of the broader community is fair game. Um, and so I think the real rule of thumb is just making sure that something new is coming out of your project. That's, that's really it. You know, I think some, some examples of maybe what doesn't work might be helpful just in kind of setting the, setting the tone. Um, I think a really great example is if something has already existed, right? If someone sent me an email today actually about uh, physical and gym equipment, and he's like, I run a gym. Um, can, I, can I use a Kickstarter to get more people to come to my gym? Um, you know, can I use it uh, as a marketing tool to get more people in the doors? And you know, the answer is, is probably not because he's not making something new. Um, if he was making a new piece of equipment, um, potentially yes, right? But if he's opening a new space and kind of designing it in a particular way, potentially that could be an architecture project, and we're pretty liberal and loose. But if you're not making something new, then it's hard to fit within the scope of Kickstarter. And the next thing is all or nothing funding. It's a really important part of how we work and of our model. Um, all or nothing funding, in short, is that at the outset of your campaign, you set a target goal, which is the amount of money that you want to raise. Um, and you set a target timeline, um, which is the length of time in which you want to raise it. And if you don't reach that goal um, in that timeline, you don't receive the funds. Um, I know this is something that can be scary for people because they say, oh, no, you know, um, what if I, you know, what if I get really close to my goal? And as you'll see on the next slide, that doesn't really happen. Um, essentially, what it does is it protects both you and your backers. Um, it's not only an exciting thing, you know, when people have a deadline, they're more likely to give quickly. But um, it also protects you in terms of when you say you're going to do something, um, you you have to you have to do it in the end if someone has pledged money. And so a great example of this is like, say I was making um, a film and I said, I need $20,000 in order to make my film. Um, I'm going to create some rewards to incentivize people to pledge, you know, a walk-on role in the film, a copy of the film itself, um, dinner with the director of the film. But then let's say, you know, I, I only raised $5,000 and some people had pledged to those rewards in that $5,000, but I didn't make it to $20,000, then I'd still have to send them the film. I'd still have to have take them out to dinner. Um, I'd still have to offer that walk-on role to the film. But the film is going to be much different from what I set out to make if I'm making it with $5,000 versus $20,000. Um, it's just not going to be the same film. And so what I pitched on the project page, what I'd written about, is actually not what's going to happen. Um, and so there's this sort of protection that happens when you say, okay, you only get the funds if you actually reach the amount that you said that you need in order to make this happen. Um, because it ensures that you're not stuck in this in-between place where you're kind of half making the film or not doing it in the way that you not only said you would, but that you wanted to. And then here, just, you know, again, kind of illustrating what I mentioned, which is that so 44% of all projects are successfully funded, but 80% of projects that reach 20% are funded. And so what that means is that even if 
once you reach 20%, there's this kind of snowballing impact that happens. And people get excited. They see that there's some momentum behind your project, and they jump on board. Um, it's very rare for someone to reach higher. I think the number two is if you 90% of projects that reach 30% are funded. Um, so you can see there that people really they, they help you out once um, there's some energy behind your project. And then the last stat here is just that 89% of all money goes to funded projects. So most of the money that's pledged on Kickstarter goes to projects that actually end up reaching 100% of their funding. And actually about 15% of projects on Kickstarter never receive a single pledge. So that's essentially people who come on the site, put up a project, and just kind of see what happens. Um, they see if someone picks it up. But if you're really working on an outreach strategy around your campaign, then um, you won't be in that 15% who, who don't receive even a single dollar. And the next section is, is about you know, how, do you, how do you tell this story? How do you share your project with your community and, and beyond? Um, I think at the heart of Kickstarter is the storytelling idea, which I think can be confusing, right? Most people are like, well, at the heart of Kickstarter, isn't it raising money? Um, isn't money at the heart of Kickstarter? But I think actually, no. I think what's more interesting to people and, and what will get them behind your project is this opportunity to really share why it's important, um, to really have people believe in you and get on your side and want to be a part of this story with you. Um, I think. The next slide, which kind of goes through the different types of ways that you tell your story, is probably the most important part of this, um, kind of the characterization of how you're able to actually share the story and get people excited. Um, the first opportunity you have to share your story is the project video, and that is your mission statement. It's you saying, this is why this project is important to me. This is why I think this this project should be important to the broader community. Um, and also, it, it should be this honest portrayal of that. Um, you should be open. It's okay not to have a professionally shot video, as long as you're, you're really just kind of sharing. You're saying, this is, this is why this is exciting. And um, you, know, you show them a little bit of your work and what you've done to say that you're the right person to be making this project. You know, if you're making a film, definitely show a clip of the film. If you're a musician, share some audio, um, or maybe sh show some, some footage of you performing. Um, but people want to see kind of who you are and connect with you in this moment of the video. And so um, it doesn't have to be very slick. It doesn't have to be overdone. But it has to be honest and give people a sense of what they're getting. And then rewards. This is the second opportunity to share your story. Um, on Kickstarter, every project has rewards associated with it, and this is the invitation into your project. Um, I mentioned earlier with the film, like a walk-on role or um, something like giving a copy of, the, of whatever it is that you're creating. If it's something that's copyable, right? Some projects are not. You can't give a copy of a theater performance, but you can give tickets to it. Um, and so it's really thinking creatively about what are these opportunities to share? How can I invite people into the work? And what can I really offer that's of value? What will people be excited about? Um, I think the key here and the key to the storytelling aspect is that you want to offer rewards that people genuinely want. Um, it shouldn't feel like they're giving you a handout or they're giving you a donation to make your own personal project. No, it should instead feel like they are actually getting to jump on board with something that's super exciting and that they genuinely want to be on board with, um, not only in your project, but in whatever the reward is that they receive. Um, it should be something that they definitely are like, yes, all that I want um, is you know, a copy of this film because it's so important to me, and I would gladly part with my $20 in order to get it um, and to become a part of the story of the creation of it. And then the third thing is project updates. I think these are often underestimated. Um, project updates are something that you send through Kickstarter. You can send them to people who have backed at a particular reward tier, or you can send them to everybody. Um, you kind of figure out what makes sense for you in that sense. But essentially what they are are these opportunities to share the creative process as it's unfolding. Um, 
give people a real sense of what it means to be making this thing that you're making. Um, show them pictures of, of your creative process. Um, show them awesome press that you have. Tell them about things that have been challenging, things that have been difficult. Um, really kind of let them behind the curtain um, because these are your first fans on this project. These are the people who are like, yes, we want you to succeed. Um, and they, they sometimes can even step in and help, right? Um, if, there's been, if there's been some sort of fallback or something that hasn't worked out, um, I see all the time where backers kind of are like, oh, I might know someone who can fix that. Um, but it also is this opportunity to, to you know, share with them kind of what it means to be a creative. Um, I think sometimes people underestimate how interesting it is to get this behind-the-scenes opportunity to see um, what it means to create anything, um, whether it's a new app or um, a new food item or just to run a food truck. Um, people want to see that once they've pledged to your project, it's really going somewhere. Um, they want to understand what it is that is being created from what they've been able to, to pledge. Um, and then the next section before we get to questions is this workshopping idea. Um, I'm going to share some tools that I think can really help when you're trying to, to work on your own project. Um, and hopefully there will be a way to kind of share these with you digitally after. Um, but I'm going to kind of walk through a project that, that I'm making up now, um, you know, one that I kind of use all the time. But to give you a sense of where to start, um, because sometimes that's the hardest part, and to also give you a sense of some of the pre-planning steps that, that need to happen in order to make sure that, that people know about your project. Because it's like, you know, you develop an awesome project video, you develop some great rewards, and um, you have some updates planned that you're going to send out. But I think kind of the hardest thing to kind of wrestle with is how do you tell people about your project? How do you um, draft an outreach strategy that's going to be really exciting um, for you to work on and also a real invitation in for people to be able to get on board with your project? Um, so there's some key questions that you have to ask yourself, and I'm just going to talk through them quickly. And then, of course, at the end, please feel free to ask me any questions about them that you might have. Um, so first is you know, your project, and this first section is about describing the basics. Um, you know, the, the key, right, is first, you know, your name's, my name's Victoria. I'm creating a, and the category is anything, as I said, from like food to journalism to technology. Um, and this is what the project is called, um, the title. And then you want to really think about what is this one sentence about your project? What is that kind of log line um, that people are going to grasp onto and be excited by um, when, they're, when they're looking at your project page? Because there is the space where you have the log line. And then people decide, hey, do I want to watch the video? Do I want to go on and read the description? Um, so it's important to have a kind of pithy one-liner about your project. Then the next part is taking a minute to define the story and figuring out what are these messages that are key to what I'm trying to create. And so here it's, it's figuring out, okay, my project um, is important because, and then think about not why are you launching a Kickstarter, which is interesting and you're going to do that, but you really want to think about why is this an important project to have in the world? Why is this something that people actually need to see? Um, and why is it important that I'm the one making it? And so a project that I often think about doing is a comic book about um, deep dish pizza in Chicago. Um, and so let's say I was filling this out. I would say you know, a deep dish comic is important to me because I'm from Chicago and I am a deep dish pizza lover. Uh, my dad taught me about it when I was a kid and ever since. Um, every time I'm able to go back to Chicago, I make sure that I have my deep dish fix. You know, I'm a Chicagoan at heart, and so I really care about um, celebrating this type of Chicago pizza through a comic. Um, and then I'm launching this on Kickstarter because I want to, you know, example goals are things like, you know, you need, you need the funds to actually make it happen. Um, you want to share it with a network of people beyond the community that you already know. Um, and maybe you, you're interested in getting feedback, too. You feel like, the, you know, for me, it's, I think the comic community on Kickstarter is absolutely awesome. It's so strong. 
um, I want to connect with those people and have them tell me what works about my project, what doesn't, and help me craft it. Um, so you want to think about them, those Kickstarter goals as well, and make sure that you outline them in the description. Then you really want to think about the community, and these are the types of people that you think will be most excited about your project. Um, these are the people who are going to be you know, sure fans of what it is that you're doing. And so you want to think through kind of what are these different communities, um, and then also why you think each of these communities will be excited. And so with my silly kind of pizza comic example, you know, I would say you know, there's a, a deep dish pizza loving community that maybe spans outside of Chicago. I know New York thinks that it has a great deep dish pizza. Um, I disagree, but maybe they just care about deep dish. So that's one community. You know, another great community is the the particular comics community in in Chicago. Um, which is really vibrant and strong. Maybe they are just excited that there's another another new comic coming out of the city. Um, and then a third community might be a more personal one. Um, maybe it's my friends and my family. It's the people who are excited that I'm creating something. Um, maybe they happen to love pizza. Maybe they happen to love comics. But at the heart, their interest in the project is, is me. Um, and they're going to be my fans kind of no matter what. And so you identify these three communities and then you figure out kind of why. Why are each of these communities going to be excited? Um, I kind of just talked through that, but you really want to zone in on why each of the communities that you're, that you're trying to reach, and it can be more than three, right? You could have ten um, or more. Uh, figure out kind of what works for you and also the scope and the scale of your particular project. But you want to figure out what the hook is for each community, and then you also want to figure out how do I reach them? Um, you know, where, what are the kind of three top influencers in that community? Like, who are the people that people in that community are really listening to? Um, who, might, who are the people who might actually be able to spread the word to a wide audience? Um, and then, two, you want to think, what are these kind of three places um, that people in these communities are, are really going to be uh, gathering in? You know, what are the organizations that are um, supporting these communities? What are the physical places? Like, you know, do all of these people go to comic school? Um, do all of these people gather at, you know, Gino's East Pizzeria um, for a discussion on different flavors on Friday nights? So, you know, you figure out what are those, like, hubs. Um, and then you want to figure out, you know, where do these people get their information? And so, you know, it could be websites. I think it could also be print media. Um, but it should be kind of press, blogs, places where people are going to be kind of counting on their, their information. You know, where do they find out about um, the, you know, the latest deep dish pizza news, right? So if I was doing this for the deep dish pizza community, you know, maybe for the three people, I want, you know, the owner of Dino's East. Um, I want this guy named Scott who does pizza tours in New York City and has a blog. Um, and then maybe I want, like, my dad who taught me about pizza, and maybe he's going to be the leader influencer in, like, my family, uh, getting them excited about this project. And then for three places, you know, I, I think Scott um, organizes these pizza tours. So maybe I ask him if I'd be able to come along on one and tell people about my project. Um, you know, I, I also might figure out that there's, like, a support group um, at – at Eduardo's about what kind of pizza is being made at Zeno's. You know, so you figure out, can really dig in, and it can. This is a a super silly kind of basic example, but for your own community, you want to figure out what are these specific places, and how do I have an in into them? How do I develop a relationship with them well before my project launches, so that by the time my project launches, people are already excited. Um, and with the influencers, you want to tell them about their project, your project super early so that they can be involved. Send them a preview of your project before it launches. Get them on your side early so that they feel like they're a part of it um, and not like you're just asking for their help kind of at the last minute. And then these are just for you know, each community, community two, community three. Um, and the next section is for your rewards. Um, when you're crafting your rewards, you want to make sure that um, the communities of people that you listed are going to be excited about the rewards and able to pledge to them at the price point that you set. Um, so it's really important to craft rewards that, that are different and kind of broad and, and have all different price points. Um, but the most important thing is figuring out 
what community would be excited about this, and making sure that you have a reward for each community um, that you've listed. And then finally, the next section is just your content, which is essentially your updates, which I mentioned earlier, um, which is how you're sharing your project over time. And you just want to make sure that you really think through this content um, early on so that you're not kind of running your campaign and then also trying to figure out, okay, what's a cool video to send out? What's a, what's a great photo to send out? Um, things will come up along the way, but you also want to have a plan laid out before you start. Um, so that you know, if there's a lull in your campaign, you know, oh, I've got that backup uh, film that I wanted to film clip that I wanted to send out. So why don't I do that now to kind of um, keep the momentum up? Um, and then this is just this is just a chart that I think you know might be helpful for people to make, which is you know, what's the type of content? What's the description of it? What community is going to be most excited about this type of content? Um, and then who from the community will be most excited to share the content, kind of send it out, and then obviously when, you know, what's the timeline in which you're sharing, you're sharing the content. Um, and so that is, that's really what I have. Um, I think this last slide is just something that we have been talking about a lot um, at Kickstarter, which is just the power of community and how exciting it is to be a part of a place where people are coming together um, and really making new things happen. I think also thinking about this community that you're building as a community and not as a crowd is actually an exciting thing because you know, crowds are anonymous. Communities are people that you know. Um, or maybe you might not know them personally, but you know what they like, right? The pizza community, they love pizza. And so you're able to really identify what is it um, that's going to be the hook into my project for each community. Um, so I hope that that kind of helps set the stage for Kickstarter and how it can be used and I'd really love to hear any questions that you guys might have for me. Thank you very much, Victoria. If you would like to pose a question and you've muted your line, remember it's star 7 to unmute your line, star 6 to mute. Or uh, please feel free to submit in the chat feature on the lower left-hand side of the screen. Victoria, while people are, are getting their questions together, we did have a couple come in while you were speaking. And one of those okay. is about the recommendation you have on, um, on um, the, let's see, the portion of your project that should be supported. Do you find that participants are more successful if Kickstarter is, for instance, only funding 75% rather than 100%? Of the project, like in total? Yes, of the project in total. Yeah, so I guess basically, there's not, um, there's not kind of Oh, actually, would you mind holding on for a moment? Sorry? Okay, sorry, we had some background noise. Please go ahead. Oh, no worries. Um, there's not like a set golden rule because every project is so incredibly different, right? So um, for some people, if their project is smaller scale and they have a really big community already, um, you know, they might not actually need um, to kind of only fund part of their project. It might be totally okay for them to fund the whole thing. Um, but if you have a huge kind of unwieldy project with lots of expenses, it probably makes sense um, for you to figure out what portion of it might be plausible for you to raise on Kickstarter. Kind of what is a component? How do you break up your project into different sections? Um, and really give them each um, a different fundraising tool, right? So at the end of the day, Kickstarter is a tool in your toolbox of fundraising options. And so you have to kind of figure out what is the best component that this <coughs> particular tool um, would be able to support. Um, and it, it also depends on size and scope, too. I hope that helps answer. Thank you. Does that help answer the question? Yeah, I think it did. Does anyone else have a question I'd like to pose? I, mean, I think that if anybody also, alternatively, maybe not a question, but just if anybody does have, if anybody does have a campaign idea um, that they that they would like to kind of bounce off of me. Um, you know, feel free to do that as well. I'd be happy to you know, talk through some ideas too, if there's that. 
And Victoria, actually that was another question that we had posed earlier before this had started and I'm not sure that it came up today. But can you talk to us a little bit about whether Kickstarter offers feedback or counseling on projects before they're submitted or is, is that what you were just referencing just now that you have to look at a project before it's actually launched? Yeah, I couldn't hear, sorry, the last part of the question. I know it's about kind of feedback. but Oh, sure. So it is... Um, I, I guess that, that, that's the question. How much, how much uh, counseling or feedback does Kickstarter offer on projects um, if it's requested? Yeah. So, uh, yes. So, essentially right now, um, there are a couple of different ways to get feedback. Um, the first one is, you know, through someone like, you know, Veronica, who I've been in touch with, you know, I think that there's, there's an opportunity based on an organizational relationship to receive feedback from Kickstarter. That's like one, one way where we often, you know, when we partner with an organization and do these kinds of talks and people um, come and listen, um, you know, definitely f feel free to kind of pass them on to me if anyone from this wants to talk to me specifically about their feedback. Um, but obviously there are, only, there are only kind of 95 of us and not all of us are traveling and giving talks to people. And so, you know, for people who might not have, um, you know, been able to access a talk or have a relationship with an organization that has a direct relationship with us, there's also great ways um, to receive feedback from Kickstarter. So essentially, once you put together your project on our page um, and you click, you know, it's all ready, you're excited, you click um, Submit, there's an algorithm on Kickstarter um, that we've built actually over the past five years that will look at a project and either flag it as um, this person should talk to a Kickstarter specialist or this person is ready to launch right away. If you have the th this person is ready to launch right away, it is what it sounds like. You're able to launch right away if you want. Or you can say, yeah, I'm so happy I'm ready to launch right away, but I'd love to get feedback from Kickstarter. Um, so you'll be faced with those, those kinds of two options. It'll say, congrats, you can launch now. Do you want feedback or do you just want to go ahead and launch? And so you can choose them. Um, if you're part of the group that initially the algorithm said you have to talk to someone, um, then you have to talk to someone and they'll help you kind of re recalibrate your campaign so that it's something that can be on site. Um, the algorithm is essentially checking to see um, if there are buzzwords like charity um, or, you know, kind of things that might be illegal on Kickstarter like you know, you can't sell guns, for example. You can't give alcohol as rewards. So your campaign can have to could be involved with alcohol. Like you could be opening a bar. Um, you wouldn't be able to like give that out to people. So if those kinds of buzzwords um, pop up on your campaign, it doesn't necessarily mean that you won't. That? You're not a good candidate for Kickstarter. It just. Oh, what's on? I'm sorry. Sorry. sorry? Hello. Yeah, it, it doesn't mean that you're that you're not a good candidate for Kickstarter. It just means that um, you might have some words in there that the algorithm picked up as potentially um, kind of outside of the scope of the site, and then you'll talk to someone kind of about it. Excellent. So it sounds like there it really is a lot of built-in support then from Kickstarter. Yeah, technical. there totally is, and I think you know something that surprised me is that. Um, you know, people people don't know that, and I think you know we could definitely do a better job of of talking about it more um, because you figure it out once you're submitting your project. But it's something that I think sometimes people don't build in that extra time um, because they don't realize that there's this opportunity for dialogue. Um, and so by the time that they've submitted, they're like, oh no, but I, I need to actually put it live like tomorrow, um, so I don't have time to kind of talk to someone. So it's it's really about kind of pre-planning and sending your your project in early enough that you do have like a week of time to hear feedback, change it, maybe hear more feedback um, before you need to launch. Thank you. All right, yeah. we are almost at the end of our time. Are there any other questions for Victoria? Last call. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you very much, Victoria. Um, yeah, as she had mentioned, um, we will um, be, be sending out a follow-up email with a uh, recording of this call and some of the other materials that she mentioned. Um, along with um, some contact information so you know how to get a hold of Victoria following this webinar. It sounds like she's very um, accessible and, and eager to answer any additional questions that you may have. Totally. Um, again, Don't be shy. Excellent. 
Uh, thank you again, Victoria. This was our first ever Iowa Arts Council Art Up, and I did want to remind everyone that we will be having an in-person Art Up this Saturday in Des Moines. It's a do-it-yourself website for makers and artists workshop, and that's in the afternoon from 1 to 5 p.m., and that uh, workshop is completely free, but you do need to register ahead of time to do that. Just go to iowaartscouncil.org and click on Professional Development. Uh, thank you again for joining us today, and uh, thanks again to Victoria. Thank you guys so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.